You are listening to the FDIP, the official podcast of the Faculty Development and Innovation Center at Eastern Illinois University. I am the director of the Faculty Development and Innovation Center, Dr. Michael Gillespie, and today we're going to team up on this episode. I have our amazing instructional designer with us, Kim Irvin. Kim. Hi, welcome everyone. We are talking about the impact of well-designed courses today, and there's several reasons for why we're we're taking a look at this. There's some new initiatives on our campus, um, looking at uh, course redesign for gen ed courses that have high D, W, and F rates. Um, there's also other student support services and other areas across campus looking at this. And this is kind of what we do. We are instructional design people, and we are uh, want to help faculty members out there maximize what they want to get not only out of their students, but out, also out of their course design. So we're going to go through just some things that we have found to be some key points to, to think about when you're designing a course. There's some really clearly defined proven practices in instructional design that will help uh, anybody yeah, it help anyone take their course, you know, to that level where the student um, is really maximizing their learning. I really enjoy instructional design consultation, right. so I want to encourage you to please do reach out to me. Um, I love to chat with people. I grew up in the '80s, so <laughs> you know, I'm I'm that extroverted person you that you know Ready likes to, to uh, in, engage with people. So. So, so let's, let's chat about this then, Kim, what, you know, we talk a lot about designing with the learner experience in mind and everything from the syllabus to the learning activities. So what will learners engage with, but still meet the rigors of learning outcomes for a course? Sure. And so when you think about that learner experience, uh, think about that experience as that time while learners are in your course and then immediately completing your course. And what your learners engage with while they're in your course and what knowledge or skills you want your learners to immediately apply after the completion of your course. Um, Designing with the learner experience in mind first actually shifts the faculty's focus of the course to the output of instruction rather than focusing on the process of instruction or the teaching. And that then puts the learner in the center also. Uh, You know, typically course design focuses and starts on the selection of learning materials and activities or the process of instruction or teaching. Mm -hmm. And One perspective on that is that that focus can limit your course design efforts because it becomes then too easy to lose sight of knowledge or skills you want your learners to engage with during the course and when they leave your course or the output of instruction. So putting your focus on the output of instruction does put that learner at the center of your course planning. So my mind immediately went to technology because there's a lot of instructional technology. We have a, a really nice suite of offerings here at EIU. And I've spoken with folks who think that they need to really uh, get as much technology into a course, whether it's face-to-face or online or a hybrid, that technology uh, it has to be in there somehow. It's sort of like the digital age that we're in, all of our students now are digital natives, right? So they're used to, to using technology, but it's not about technology. It's about the learning process. Yeah, it really, really is. Technology is important. Um, but when you consider instructional design and all its facets, such as first, you know, just having a knowledge of what the learning sciences say about the best ways we learn, and then having knowledge of frameworks or concepts and strategies for effective teaching, And then finally getting to the uh, pen to paper, so to speak, and developing the learning outcomes and objectives, followed by the assessments, and then the course content, you know, the learning materials and the activities. Instructional technologies serve as a modality to deliver assessments and course content, but technology instruction should be thoughtful intentional, and really driven by sound, learner-centered, like what we just talked about, 
pedagogical approaches uh, that incorporate what the learning sciences say about the best ways we learn and utilizes the frameworks and the concepts and the strategies for effective teaching. So we talk a lot about uh, proven practices that are really about the design of the structure of a course, which of course is, is instructional design. Um, you know, you you have your backward design model, which is fantastic. But even thinking about uh, little things like interleaving, so that you have information that it was previously learned is uh, interleaved in with new content, so you can see how content sort of creates uh, that structure of course or scaffolding. So you're ramping up to a large uh, assessment or some kind of project. Even little things like prediction activities or having students do reflections or self-assessment are important pieces of this. But can you talk a little bit? about just this backward design model and how it helps uh, with the impact of, of a well-designed course? Sure. I talk a lot about backward design, and I'm not going to go into a dissertation or anything here in this podcast, but just a reminder about what backward design is. It's a process to course design that asks you to first develop your um, learning objectives or your outcomes and then determine what assessments are going to validate the completion of those outcomes and objectives and then develop the course content, the learning materials and the activities that will support successful completion of the assessments. And I compare the template that we offer our faculty to use that's based on the backward design model as providing faculty a unique perspective to look at their course, like they're in a helicopter looking at their course from a very unique perspective. Some ways that faculty look at their course is through their syllabus. And while that is a very necessary element for courses, it's not quite the high-level right. course perspective right. that includes everything sure. in the design of the course. Right. It's almost as if the syllabus should be the last thing that you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah or, really. come, or come towards the end of your of your planning, because then you it's sort of like writing the introduction to your paper. Exactly, right? I just you thought write the, the same paper thing first, right? And yeah. then and how do you know what you're introducing if you haven't written the paper yet? That's you know? right. So, That's right. So the template that we can offer, and we'll put a link to it in the show notes, yeah. provides you opportunity to list your course objectives, then your module objectives, or those could be weekly chapter um, objectives, then fill out the assessments that you'd like to verify those objectives, and then the course content, what course materials and what learning activities are going to make the student successful in completing those assessments. There's a couple different additional columns that I've placed on the template. One of them is teaching strategies. Yeah. So you can identify some of the things that you, you mentioned earlier, interleaving, scaffolding, prediction, self-assessment, right. reflections, alternative assessment methods. So you can identify the use of those um, within your course. And then the other thing that's really a hot, hot topic right now, and it should be, is accessibility. Right. And so I really advocate asking if your course content, the materials that you're selecting and the activities that you're choosing, think about the accessibility of those things as you're selecting them. That's much more efficient and easier on the faculty if they do that rather than select the material and the activity and then come back later and think, oh, how am I going to make this accessible? So that's the purpose of having it on the template. It's that learner-centered mindset of yeah. designing your course, right? That's yeah. a piece of it. You want the, the, to be yeah. accessible. Yeah, so this template really um, provides a, you've heard of visualization maps, right. but it's a textual mm-hmm. visualization map, yeah. you know, of your course. And you talked to, you know, that there's, there's the map and you can kind of helicopter away to see the big picture of this, but there's other benefits from that besides seeing sort of the, just the, the our overarching course of your course. What are some other benefits of that? Yeah. One grand purpose of instructional design is to ensure that your course is aligned. And so when we have all of the course content plotted in this template, you can easily tag this activity and this learning material relates to this objective. This assessment relates to these objectives. And you can actually tag behind each assessment 
and each learning material and activity what objective right. they serve, sure. yeah. support. Yeah, absolutely. So that helps ensure course alignment. And course alignment is when all the course elements work together to promote a learner's achievement of the intended learning outcomes. Right. That's great. You know, another thing we talk about, and it kind of goes along with what we just said about, you know, making sure that we're uh, accessible to everybody uh, is inclusive course design. Um, and this, you know, in our world, this goes from from DEI initiatives, diversity, equity, uh, and inclusion through universal design. And they, they kind of pair together a little bit because universal design uh, is, is a, really about the structure of your course and how students can access it. But DEI initiatives, especially in inclusive design, is also about the content of the courses as well. And it, it you know touches on everything from the pedagogy that you come to your course with, to assessment methods and, and everything in, bec- in between. So can we talk a little bit about inclusive course design, yeah. Kim? Because it really is a, an impactful piece of, of how we design courses. Yeah. And when you think of inclusive course design, I my thoughts reflect back on a recent podcast that I listened to where the authors of the book, Inclusive Teaching Strategies to Promote Equity in the College Classroom by Viji Sathy and Kelly Hogan. They were they are authors of that book and they were being interviewed in this podcast. And I think, I've, I'll be transparent, I have not read that book, but since I've listened to the podcast, I want to. And I think what they address in their book is that Every pedagogical decision should be countered with two questions. One, who might be left behind because of my teaching practice? And then how can I invite those left behind learners in? And the example that is, I think it's going to stick with me for a long time because it was so impactful, is um, one of them shared a student coming into their office for office hours and sharing that they were experiencing test anxiety. And so taking that specific situation in the context of the two questions that I just read, the instructor thought about, well, what if there are other students in the class that are experiencing test anxiety? They just not express that to me yet. Mm -hmm. So how can I address this to include others that might be left in, left out? How can I include them? So the way they remediated this was first of all, to convey to the students that I'm not here to trick you. I will never purposefully trick you. If you're taking a test and the answer for the third time in a row is C, that's not a trick. (laughs) And then another remediation that they, they offered was they allowed one page of notes for all the students to reference while they were taking the test. Right. So they took a concern, a barrier that one student was experiencing and expressed and then tried to include everyone right. in the class that may be experiencing that same barrier. Right. You know, we talk a lot about how, you know, somebody's going to ask a question. Other people probably have that same question too. And even during a lecture or discussion section of something and for a student to walk into an office like that and say, Hey, I'm having test anxiety. You're probably is a good bet that there's a couple more people at least in that class who are experiencing a, a very similar thing. And that's sort of what these approaches are all about, right? Then we want to make sure that we're reaching everybody uh, and everybody has the, the opportunity to be their best self, their best learner within our courses. So universal design, uh, is part of this, right? So, so let's talk a little bit about universal design because this is a really important thing that we uh, continually talk about and there's some main tenets to this. Let's dive a little bit into that, can we, Kim? Yes, and you know, universal design for learning or UDL for short is a framework that really epitomizes inclusive course design because it aims to make learning accessible and effective for all students regardless of their diverse abilities and backgrounds. Mm-hmm. Um, It's based on the idea that there's no one-size-fits-all approach to learning and that learning experiences should be designed to accommodate and support the needs and wants of many learners. It's um, based on three principles, um, and one principle is uh, multiple means of representation, providing, you know, information in various formats, um, like and, a podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Like an audio podcast. Yeah. And then multiple means of action and express expression, offering students various ways to demonstrate their understanding and knowledge. 
and then multiple means of engagement, Mm -hmm. offering diverse and flexible methods for engagement. So it's really diversifying how students can engage with the course, right? Everywhere, yeah. uh, you know, from the representation so that they can uh, engage with course materials in a format and in a modality that's going to be best for their success to, you know, maybe, you know, maybe a student's not so good about writing a paper, but can really produce a, a wonderful you know, PowerPoint and give a lecture or give a, uh, a speech on a certain topic. Maybe yeah. they're more audio rather than, than written. So it's the ability to, to be able to adapt yeah. a little bit to that writing. Yeah, so for multiple forms of representation, um, assign readings outside of class. Right. The common way to assign that is to provide the PDF or provide the link right. and expect that the student will read that outside of class, come to class, maybe prepared for a discussion. Mm-hmm. Maybe consider... No, other ways that you can provide access to that information. Um, one way might be to provide information on how they can incorporate a screen reader or yes. an immersive reader to have that document read back to them. Right. I know Word has an immersive reader built in, so right. if it's a Word document, just let them know that that's available. Sure. Another option, too, is is for the instructor to record reading yeah. the Material if it's not too lengthy, right. if it's an article, something like that. Yeah. Read, read it, make an MP3 file and upload it to to your course D2L shell, um, yeah. which is everyone has access to that. Of course, whether you're face to face course or not, um, that way that students can listen to that on the go, mm-hmm. mobile. And then another tip that I heard that I'm going to keep this in my hip pocket, but I'm going to share it with all of our listeners too, is that. If the students are not reading their assignment and they're coming to class and you're having to do a lecture on the reading assignment, Mm -hmm. go ahead and record that lecture and make that lecture available outside class. So now you've provided three ways for them to digest that information before Mm -hmm. they come to class and hopefully increased the um, Mm -hmm. likelihood that the student will have engaged in that content and they'll be more prepared for discussion when they come to class. That's right. Yeah. And then like multiple means of um, action and expression, you have an assignment. Could there be multiple ways that they complete that assignment Mm -hmm. through written paper, PowerPoint presentation? Right. And then the third principle that we talked about, multiple means of engagement, offering diverse and flexible methods of engagement. You have an assignment. Is it possible for the instructor to let the student pick the topic? Mm-hmm. And I, I think probably a lot of that already goes on. Um, I think I, I hear about a, a lot sure. of a lot of that being offered mm-hmm. within courses. But a couple other things to keep in mind, too, is like if it's a book report, mm-hmm. providing a list of books yeah. that the student could choose one Um, to do the book report on, and then possibly even adding the ability for the student to submit a book that they would like to do the book report on. And then you, you're available to review it and then approve whether or not the book report can be done on the book that they, the student suggests. I had a, I had a conversation with a a music faculty member a couple weeks ago and they were talking about, we were talking about course design (laughs) and they were describing how they would have students work on curriculum for music education in elementary and middle schools. And they had to put together a sample lesson plan to talk about music for the students. And in the past, that was really about here's, you know, three or four pieces that you need to use to go create your lesson plan. And instead of having those prescribed pieces, it was opened up to, you need to pick a piece Mm -hmm. that you're going to do. And they said that it changed the the world for how students were successful in that, that they really struggled with that assignment. They weren't feeling connected to the music, but once they were able to pick something that they felt connected to the student outcomes there just changed dramatically. Yeah. And it also replicates what they're going to have to do out in the real world, you know, select those materials themselves. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. So, So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the little changes like that is really what this is about. Like little changes like that can have such an impact on how students receive and retain information, but also then are successful in applying that information. Yeah. And I really think going back to that backward design template, 
sitting on top of your course and looking down on it, I think is when those come more natural and easier. Right. You can see it all right there right mm-hmm. in front of you. So it's, mm-hmm. I mean, they're very impactful, very empowering things, you know, and you had mentioned a little bit too about um, authentic and, and real world learning experiences when those students are in their own classrooms for real, past their student teaching and having to do this and now makes it, you know, that much more impactful for them to be able to choose what's in their curriculum, having already gone through that. Here's what it feels like to think about what kind of music do I want to present to my students? Why do I want to do this? Why is it important? How does it connect with all these themes? And they're going to be doing that. They've already had that. They've received feedback from their instructor. They've had guidance on it. And now when they're out in the real world, it seems like, ah, I've done this. Right. I have this. You right. Know? And that's another one of those just really impactful things. It just makes such a difference, right? Yeah. It won't be the first time that they've offered it. Exactly. You know, but yeah. 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 So we, I mean, we talk about authentic and rural assessments uh, here all the time and how, how you can, you can put that in. And I think that's really, you know, one of the powerful points under UDL that really makes students connect mm-hmm. to the content of the course mm-hmm. so it, as real as you can make it. That's going to be, you know, the real kind of hook to get them in. That's right. That's right. Uh, Provides that intrinsic motivation. And when adults um, are learning, they want to see the fruits of their their labors. They want to know the why and they want to they want to know the why so they can validate what they're learning is going to serve a purpose once they're finished with the class. Uh, Hopefully uh, through this, you know, our listeners have seen that this is. I mean, some of this stuff is just really small tweaks, right? Mm -hmm. You know, talk about, you know, backward design and a template, but each one of those little things on this template is just like a small little dial. You might turn one or two things that have just tremendous impacts and designing a new course or going through a course design process is daunting. I've done it a lot. I know a lot Mm -hmm. of folks have done it, but the outcome of it is really you know, powerful. Absolutely. For everybody involved. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe uh, just a couple more benefits I wanted to mention too, is like when you have this view of your course in this template, you know, and have every component, you um, are able to evaluate course load a little bit easier. Um, And like you kind of just hit on, which made me think of these extra benefits too, is it simplifies the redesign efforts. Yeah. Um, so when you run into a snag in a class, you can immediately go to this template and look at how you've got that piece fit in and, and redesign. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that didn't work. This worked really well. mm -hmm. This worked well for this learning activity. Maybe I need to think about how I can apply that to a different learning activity where I had good Mm -hmm. outcomes on. You can kind of see the whole thing right there in front of you. Um, so a few other things I think might be useful just to, to toss out. I know sometimes uh, we might glance over some of this, but connecting students with other resources besides the course content and materials and their peers within the course can also have a big impact. Um, I'm thinking about academic support services like tutoring, mentoring programs for students and those sorts of things, even mental health and counseling services. You know, we know those are, those are really big right now on college campuses and students are flocking towards those kinds of services. So even just being at the ready, just to be able to say, Hey, here's where you can go talk to your advisor. Here's where you can go talk to a counselor. Here's where you can go to get some food at the food pantry, yeah. having those sorts of connections too. It really, it really fosters that sense of you're in the right place. Yeah. These services are available to you. We want you to use them. Mm-hmm. Um, you belong here. Holistic belongingness. Right. Yeah, it really is. From the writing center, right, to uh, tutoring within the departments, to you know extracurricular activities, like having all that, that holistic picture also helps with the student success. But when you build that into a syllabus statement or you talk about it in class or you, you bring that in, it also helps that student see that you're connected as well. Mm-hmm. But that it's just this relationship you have just isn't in the classroom, but it's a, a community. It's a campus-wide kind of thing too. Yes. We, I mean, we love to do this and we have um, Kim, who's our lead instructional designer. We have our instructional support and training staff who can help implement a lot of the instructional technologies uh, and even uh, with some of the ideas that we talked about today and then so much more, but this is what we do and this is what we exist to do. Absolutely. And I, and my, a little bit, like I said at the very beginning, my approach to this is to partner with faculty. Um, I'm certainly not going to know everything that the faculty member knows and vice versa. And so I look at as a partnership and a teaming 
yeah. with faculty to provide the best course design yeah. that we can yeah. and baby steps. Sure. Yeah, also, baby steps, right? Yes. Little, just little things. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, we talk to our students about, uh, you know, and one of the big things when students come to visit campus is we have small classes. You can have one-on-one -on -one attention from your instructor. Well, we have this unit on campus where you can get one-on-one -on -one attention from people who are design experts. That's right. Bring your content expertise down. Talk with us about the design of that course and partner with us so that we can implement that together. Yes. Yeah. And that's yep. really what really what the DWF initiative is about is you come with the content, let us help you with the design, and let's see what we can do for those students. That's right. Let's bounce ideas off of each other. Yeah. Yep. Let's do it. So, well, we want to thank you for listening to this episode of the FDIP. I like it when we partner on these I do, too. We, yeah. We have these conversations. Uh, and so please do uh, come check us out. Well, Pedagogy Day is coming up. We're going to have uh, a couple episodes on that. Oh, and I hope everyone can, yeah. can make that. It's going to be is yeah. You're gonna That's going to be a wonderful opportunity. Great keynote speaker coming to yeah, campus. Um, Butler, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and and a lot of the the presentations that will happen throughout the day are all EIU folks kind of putting into place some of these things that we talked Absolutely, about. Absolutely, yeah. So, so it's your it colleagues. Right. Yeah. So it's going to be great. So we hope you can join us for that and for all the other opportunities that we have too. So Kim, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Great. I appreciate you. Appreciate you too. And we'll talk to everybody soon. Thanks. Bye-bye.